it's just such a complete pleasure to be here tonight to uh, have this conversation with Chloe Hooper. Um, I was just telling some people from Penguin Publishing who have put this wonderful, remarkable book together uh, about how I felt uh, as an editor of a magazine when Chloe's essay came through on the email, um, which was the beginning of this book um, to, to the monthly. And I happened to be in rural Queensland and I, I printed it off in this dusty little email internet booth and read it and it was just one of those incredibly rare moments uh, when an editor gets to read an essay and just be completely floored by what you read so um, it feels like we've really you know this is the culmination of, of this um, incredible journey that Chloe has been on for the past years now so um, it's a it's a particularly special thing to be here and it's great to see you all here um, I thought we'd start um, you know, Chloe describes the Palm Island Mission, um, which served as a reserve and an open-air jail um, way back from 1918 until the late 60s as a kind of tropical gulag in this book. And I thought um, that, that that was a point where perhaps Chloe could set the scene of this tale for those of you that perhaps don't know the bare bones of it, but also to describe a little bit about what Palm Island is like. Is it, is it still a tropical gulag? Thanks, Sally. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming tonight. Uh, well, Palm Island is an astonishingly beautiful place, and it's uh, perhaps the most beautiful island in the magnetic uh, group just east of Townsville. Um, it, it does have a very sad history in that uh, from 1918 people from 40 different tribes around Queensland were, were sent to the island often for very uh, minor things such as asking about their wages or a speak, being caught speaking their traditional languages. Cameron Dumaji's uh, stepfather Arthur was sent to the island in around, uh, at around 1950 after having uh, punched out a missionary who was flogging his uncle uh, in the Gulf, uh, in the mission town of Dumaji in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, I, I went there in, I went to Palm Island for the first time in February 2005, two and a half months after Cameron Dumaji had been found dead on a watch uh, on the cell floor of, a, of the Palm Island watch house he'd sworn at a at senior sergeant Hurley and uh, was was arrested and and uh, was soon dead with horrific injuries I, I just want to say that I, I refer to uh, Cameron uh, as Cameron uh, there um, there is a convention in the Gulf of Carpentaria that you call a deceased person uh, Murunyu, uh, which is, means the departed one, and uh, it's used, that term's used so as not to call uh, back the dead. Uh, it, it's used for a couple of years, and uh, th that, that time's now expired, but uh, you know, the, the strange thing is that uh, Cameron's family always called him Cameron, and actually in the end it was the sort of white lawyers and journalists who, who called him uh, eventually Mulrangi, which and it says a, a, an enormous amount that we actually can't get his name right. Mm -hmm. You describe being picked up by a taxi driver when you first arrived in on Palm Island and you write that um, he began complaining about people arriving from down south. He could always pick them. And you asked him how, and, and he replied, because they're fuckwits. <laughs> and of course, you know, here we are, we're in readings in Carlton, in Melbourne. The we're all fuckwits here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you, you know, we're in this cultural bastion of, of Australia. And, um, you know, one of the things... I wondered about reading this book. It's obviously a book about black and white, but it's also a book about north and south, mm -hmm. and a divide that um, 
I often feel that as a Melbourne person, no matter how far I roam, um, I can't bridge it. And so what was it like to arrive there with that sort of confrontation and um, did it ever, did it change? Uh, I, well, there is a, there is an intense north-south divide and uh, I do think that you, you do have to suspend, you know, uh, your southern sensibilities when you, you head north. Uh, and, uh, you know, at, at first when I went to Palm Island, there was this figure of, of Senior Sergeant Hurley who almost seemed ogre-like. And I was hearing stories about how he had allegedly um, run over a woman's foot, who actually is Cameron Dimaggi's niece, and then left her lying on the ground. And so uh, the figure that I had of him was uh, sort of of an, of an archetypal bad guy. And slowly I realised that that was uh, that that was sort of completely unnuanced and 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 wrong. That actually he was this man who had. Uh, in some ways been almost a model cop and he was decorated for his bravery he had set up uh, clubs for indigenous kids in communities he'd worked at sports worked in sports clubs he had Aboriginal friends he um, was very well respected and so how had this figure found himself in this situation where I mean and today he's one of the most polarizing figures in, in the country if you're thinking about race relations and I've just heard actually that um, he's been promoted and um, tomorrow it's going to be announced that he's um, he'll be um, has moved up a, ra uh, a rank um, and I, I guess uh, you know the reality is that policing in these communities is extremely tough and incredibly traumatic and none of us know if we were confronted with scenes of violence that really um, aren't so standard in the mainstream, how, how we'd react. I was um, very struck reading this book about, um, the, with the anthropological qualities of it, that's partly because I'm an anthropologist by trade, um, not, not an editor, um, and I worked in the slums of India and I'm aware of what it's like to step into an incredibly confronting and different um, situation. Um, you talked about an interview you did with a well-regarded inspector who'd served on Palm Island and the question that you didn't ask him and, and the question was can you step into this dysfunction and desperation and not be corrupted in some way and I, I just wondered how you as Chloe Hooper, um, you know, how, how would you answer that question? Oh, Sally, why are you so smart? <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, I guess I wasn't living in the community and I would visit the community. Uh, I've probably visited Palm Island about 10 times and I uh, not, never for longer than a week. I would find sometimes when I travelled there that after about three or four days, and I, it actually seemed seems normal to to you. And I um, mean, this is one of the things. That, this is one of the uh, you know when you wade into a subject like this, there are so many people saying, well, you know, uh, why do you think you can write about this? And, you know, what do you know? And I, I, certainly the, the anthropologist Peter Sutton talks about tragedy tolerance. When you first uh, land, it's so stark. And then you sort of start to think, oh, well, you know, I guess it's, this is just the way things are here. And, but uh, they, they shouldn't be. I shouldn't live 20 years longer than somebody born on Palm Island and uh, Cameron Dumaji shouldn't be dead within 40 minutes of swearing at a white police officer. In terms of my corruption, uh, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> um, I, I should say that, that Chloe's presence in the book um, as a reader to me is is absolutely 
perfect. Um, it's a big debate within anthropology how much the anthropologist should be in the ethnography um, and so too with a, a, a reportage like this and um, it, it's it, it, the present, I mean some of the questions I'm asking Chloe uh, to extract a bit more um, because this is a book about um, this case and this man Cameron, these two men, Cameron Dumaji and Chris Hurley, it's not a book about um, uh, a, a, a young writer who goes off to explore this. The presence, I think, is um, quite exceptional in, a, in, a, in its tone and um, in, in its quantity. I want to ask you um, about Cameron Dumaji and Chris Hurley. You never met, of course, Cameron Dumaji. Um, and I wanted to ask you what, what it was like to focus so fully on trying to to unpick what happened to this man around our age um, who died, um, this premature and tragic death, but to not know him. Um, you know, one of the sentences that really affected me in, in this book was that he was going to go fishing on the morning that he, of the day that he died. He was going to borrow a boat and go fishing and it was this exceptionally just simple human action and I don't know why there was something in that sentence that I was able to picture him more fully than I had been able to and um, and Chris Hurley of course is alive and he's somebody that you saw um, although you never interviewed him and I, I just wondered who you felt you got to know more out of these two men you know um, I sometimes worried and I mention it briefly in the book that I was spending so much time thinking about the events around Cameron's death without actually um, thinking about you know uh, who he or knowing who he was. And one thing that I didn't want to do, I didn't want to write a book about issues. I wanted this to be about people. So it it, it worried me uh, sometimes that uh, that I was uh, it was very important to me to hold on to that. In the end, you know, that, that I, I do mention that, oh, I just said, you know, we, we couldn't get Ca Cameron's name right. Um, and probably I have more points of connection to Senior Sergeant Hurley. And uh, I felt that I had, I knew him better, probably in the end, than, than Cameron. But I also, you know, travelled to, to the Gulf town of Dumaji and spent time with his family on their traditional land and I, I felt, you know, it, it is through the idea of fishing and I, I spent a lot of, you know, Ben Ball, my editor, at one point wrote a note to me which was, are you going to make some comment about the amount of time fishing you've spent while you're writing this book? Um, and uh, while I was fishing I did feel sometimes, you know, it can be such a balm and such a beautiful uh, <laughs> thing to be doing compared to life um, in the community, you know, on a, on a Thursday night um, and uh, that I had a sense then of, of, of getting close to at least what, what Cameron loved doing. You talk about the Palm Island Cemetery and you describe it as, you say the Palm Island Cemetery was a field of white wooden crosses against a backdrop of mountains. Most of its graves were carefully tended and adorned with colourful plastic flowers. And I was quite struck by this, the contrast to this cemetery um, with the chaos and destruction that was going around in this town around you and that in, in, in contrast to life on the island, which was full of disorder, and here is this beautifully tended cemetery. And it made me very, very sad um, to think that the death in some ways seems to be the only expectation um, and the thing that is really known and the cast of characters in this book who die it, it, it's it's devastating it's not just Cameron Dumaji his son Eric young son uh, teenage son suicided um, and and Chloe also looks at that and attended his funeral um, Cameron Dumaji's mother is now dead um, it, it, is, it is a story about death. It is a heart of darkness 
story. Um, but I, I just wondered if you had feelings like that about the cemetery too. It, it, it was really striking to me. It was really upset me. I, I'm mentioning, I'm going to mention Peter Sutton again, who um, I was, you know, that that field of white crosses that I saw. Uh, I read his description of visiting the Arakoon Cemetery and and thinking that it looked like uh, a um, a grave in of um, Australian soldiers in in France. And uh, there's a similar a body count and and toll a young among uh, young indigenous men and and it's a national tragedy that uh, you know the mayor of Palm Island said to me when I the first day I arrived she was watching some young men walking along the road and and she said who knows their potential and um, she also asked that question of her of her parents and her grandparents who had been. Um, I guess um, lived in that gulag uh, and uh, and did have to um, they did have to salute every, every you know white people that they passed in the street or uh, they did have to apply they you know they weren't paid their wages they were forced into poverty and I mean I met a man who would be in his mid fifties who told me about a night when or he was playing cricket and and his ball uh, his cricket ball. Uh, broke off a, a short branch of tree, and he and he was made to spend the night in jail. Um, you know, um, um, and well, she was saying about her parents, who knows their potential as well. And uh, you know, uh, this is something which I, I think we, we uh, as a uh, a country, we 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 don't want we don't want this to keep happening. I'm, I'm going to quickly read um, before I throw it open to the audience. A, um, a very short letter that was written to the, 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 the lawyer, Andrew Bow, who was um, very involved in, in this case from the start and who really was the person who took it on and who Chloe met. And, um, it was a letter written to him by a, uh, a Queensland police officer. Dear Andrew, I've been a Queensland police service officer for over 20 years. I've just read the findings of Sir Lawrence Street and recognise this as a huge achievement for all the Aboriginal people. Not all police are racists and liars, many are. I have witnessed this for myself firsthand. It is time the community, the government and the Queensland Police Service Executive saw for themselves that some Queensland Police Service officers actually support and respect the Aboriginal people. The people, the public need to know that not all police in the union support the hysterical claims of the executive. Good luck, at least one police officer was on your side. Um, I'd like to know whether this was a, a rare thing or whether, the, 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 you know, you talk about Chris Hurley, that, you know, he really did, um, he really was involved with the, the, the lives, particularly the children, as you said, of um, Aboriginal communities. So. Whether, whether this kind of a, a, a view is rare and also um, from the Aboriginal side as well where um, the, the, do most people who live in these tragedies um, see it as complex and impossibly complicated or as um, very sort of polarised? I, I don't think it was a complete coincidence that the do I mention that the woman that it was a female police officer? No. All right. Well, um, um, yeah. Uh, it was a lot of, <laughs> that was a. Um, uh, sorry about that. That's an editing mistake. No, uh, I didn't want. I guess I didn't want to. You know, there might only be three women in the force. So. Um, I I think that. Um, this has been incredibly polarising, this, this case, and uh, I don't think that, well, I mean, the hysterical claims of the executive that this officer is talking about, um, you know, the police union after Hurley was charged with manslaughter, 
threatened to strike and they wore, uh, they produced, uh, mass produced uh, blue armbands with Senior Sergeant Hurley's serial number, which uh, the, uh, the police were wearing and, and wore in Aboriginal communities and wore as they arrested young Aboriginal men. Um, I, I think that uh, there were definitely police officers who, uh, well, you know, there is a, there. Everyone knows that there's a sort of, and I, well, I didn't know, but it's well documented that there's a one, you know, all for one, one for all mentality, you know, amongst cops, and there are lots of reasons why why that is the way it is. I was surprised at the um, sort of almost blanket support that the senior sergeant uh, received. And uh, by the police union campaign, in which you know they Martin Luther King was invoked uh, to suggest that he had you know a great wrong had been done to Senior Sergeant Hurley. Um, I, I think that a lot of, uh, but I don't. Th I think there are people on both sides who who see that this is you know more complicated than than we would uh, we would you know than maybe the, the mainstream media would would have it. Towards the end of this story, um, the final court case and the verdict, there, there are um, a, a couple of moments that come on quite quickly on your response and you sort of, where you feel an impact about what you've been through and not just you of course, the, the whole situation but I'm interested in you because you're here talking to us this evening um, and when your response just comes to the to the forefront and there were there were three that really struck me really in the last two chapters one was when Chris Hurley um, the police officer looked at you for the very first time in in court the second was um, also after the verdict and there was unseasonal rain and Chloe was crossing the road with an umbrella and shared you shared your umbrella with one of Cameron Dumagee's either relatives or, or, or certainly supporters. And finally, when you um, observed the family thanking one of the lawyers, um, and, you know, obviously things hadn't gone their way and they were thanking him and shaking his hand for fighting on their behalf. And this completely overwhelmed you, that this, this small moment of just human generosity um, that, that they were so composed, that his family could be so composed in this moment of they hadn't won and uh, and that this overwhelmed you after all you'd sort of sat through and observed and that that would that, that there must be an exhaustion in that that to focus on death and um, you know a tragic situation for so long must be very overwhelming so I wonder um, are you a you know a different person from that, and what what you might do next? Um, because I just imagine you would want to be be removed from death. Um, well, this stretched me, uh, and uh, I'm very lucky for that. And uh, but I, I I really. You know, there were moments in this which were exhausting and confronting, but I just don't, you know, to, to talk about, you know, what what I've been through is is, is seems completely false, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't think about it in those terms. It has been a heavy couple of years, and, and you know, you, you know that, that uh, it's been very... Um, at times this material has been... Uh, there haven't been... There hasn't been so much light... Uh, light through throughout it. I, I guess part of it is. Sing um, off. I guess part of that is. If we did a sing along now, I feel so much better about it. <laughs> I guess part of it is thinking about the people that do this constantly for a living, too. That yeah. the people that devote themselves to this work day in, day out for years on end. I mean, you will leave it and, and write your next novel. Yes. Yes, I, 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 um, I'm, I'm looking forward to working on I mean, I put down a novel to, to write this book and I, I am so um, thankful that I did, but I, um, you know, it'll be a bit like getting out of the sea and into a warm bath. And um, uh, I think, you know, I'm not sure it's a great idea to sort of, you know, keep on. I, I don't think it would be good to move to another project like this. Oh. 
had a record of similar experiences with serious injury to people in his custody or whether this genuinely was a one-sided... Okay, yeah. Um, the question is whether or not Chris Hurley had a, a history of these kind of um, offences or whether it was a, a one-off. In terms of the seriousness of it, Well, I guess sure this was the most a... serious sort of, uh, you know, way, obviously, that... You know, this this was very serious. I mean, uh, in, in the book... Uh, I do detail that there have been uh, quite a number of allegations against Senior Sergeant Hurley for violence or in arrest type situations. He denies all of these these claims, um, and that's about as much as I can say. But we we talk. Well, I go into the uh, to more detail um, in the book, and uh, the Penguins lawyers have um, <laughs> have okayed that. <laughs> I imagine Penguin's lawyers are eating in fancy restaurants over this one. Uh, the lady here. Um, Chloe, uh, how do you negotiate the ethical issues of writing a story where the people you talk to are so vulnerable mm. in so many mm. ways, mm. when you're kind of outside yeah. the ethics of journalism mm. and yeah. anthropology mm. yes. in that sense? Like, what mm. did you leave out? With, uh, not yeah. what did you leave out, but yeah. how do you make those choices yeah. to tell the story? Well, um, you know, I, I, as a journalist, you do have a code of conduct, and as an anthropologist, you usually have, you know, so, you know, everybody signs something. And uh, I was working sort of um, outside both of those um, traditions, and uh, you know, I really just had my own code of conduct. So, um, I and I can't necessarily vouch for it, <laughs> but I, I think I've I've uh, I've tried, you know. As hard as I as I can to, and I, as I sort of mentioned, I've, I you know every sentence, you know there's a there's a weight that's there, and I I have a debt to the Dumaji family and to that community which um, which is ongoing. And uh, <clears throat> Cameron's great niece is is now my goddaughter, and mm -hmm. I you know where we will I think all be linked for. Uh, a long time but you know at the end of the day you know I, I suppose I just felt I had to tell the truth and uh, I, I hope that I've done it the right way I'm only allowed to ask one more question um, can you talk a, a bit more about how you develop that trust with the Dumaji family so, so quickly it would seem um, the question was, how did Chloe um, develop the trust with the Dumaji family so quickly? I was in an extremely fortunate situation to be uh, invited into the community along with Andrew Bow, a Burmese-born lawyer who was working pro bono for the community. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I realised until later that he had been accepted because he wasn't white. And... Uh, I, you know, they they wanted their brother's story to be told, and or for this situation to be to be known, and um, so I, I was just very fortunate to to be to step in that you know at that moment and and be accepted. But there there was a, a funny moment where. Uh, you know, I had convers we had conversations. I'm a I'm a writer, and this is what I'm doing. And um, uh, at one point, at the at the beginning of the inquest, Elizabeth Dumaji, uh, Cameron's sister, um, said to the mayor of the island, "Look, I've seen other people. Other people are are taking notes. You know, in the inquest, uh, we have our writer here. I want them back." <laughs> and there's a sort of megalomaniacal, you know, strain if you're a writer, and you're like. That would be great. You know, like, take all their pens away, put in their notes. I'll do it. No, I didn't. Uh, I, I said that would be all right if they wrote too. Um, Chris is going to take over now, but I, I just want to congratulate Chloe both personally and you know professionally on this um, incredible work and what she's put into it and. Uh, the monthly essay was Chloe's first substantial non-fiction essay and she picked up a Walkley Award for it. Um, 
I, I think that this book um, is going to get um, the equivalent um, response in the um, wider reading public. So I encourage you all to read it and, and um, just wonderful work, Chloe. I meant to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank I just you. wanted to thank you. <laughs> on behalf of Penguin, on behalf of Readings, Books, Music and Film, please join me as we show our gratitude to these two women for bringing these stories to us. <laughs>